Hi everyone. As you know, I'm not feeling well today. I do have a, a temperature, uh, but fortunately, with the uh, um, the use of technology, I can uh, record this this way. So um, hopefully, it goes well. So today, we're talking about assessment practices, and um, and so I'm just my slides on my lights. Okay. <clears throat> so um, so we're going to talk about responsiveness to intervention, referrals, assessment methods, written language assessment, and caseload management. As we always do, uh, prior knowledge that you bring to this class are a lot, your knowledge of form content and use, and the modalities of receptive and expressive language, as well as the collateral issues that are associated with uh, assessment for communication uh, functionality, and the general types of assessment tools and strategies, uh, as well as the severity classifications for eligibility for services. The learning objectives for today, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe response to intervention, or RTI, uh, and identify the SLP's role uh, in each tier. You should be able to identify how children are referred for SLP services in schools, explain the elements of assessment for diagnosis and name at least seven of those uh, key elements, identify differences in static assessment versus dynamic assessment, list at least eight different types of di data that can be extracted from language sample analysis, identify key aspects of caseload management, and describe four types of scheduling practices that SLPs consider for being able to manage their large caseloads. If you're not aware of it, uh, the standardized test assignment has been posted on eClass. I believe that URIN is uh, offering some support around uh, questions people have. Certainly on the forum, you can post your questions. Please don't post questions with the actual answers, like, is this right? Um, uh, or, or, or asking pointed questions. Ask, uh, uh, she's happy to answer general questions uh, and, um, and support you in whatever ways that she can. So let's get started with responsiveness to intervention, so RTI. So um, you may know already that this is, is made up of three tiers or a multi-level tier um, of support in schools. At the tier one level is classroom instruction. And at this level, the uh, uh, optimal circumstances would be that the school would be using universal screening for both oral and written language. <clears throat> that allows us to be able to identify those kiddos uh, using screening measures to uh, who are their progress should be monitored. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be monitoring other children who are uh, who pass the screener, but just slightly above the criteria for the screener. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, the double asterisk here uh, is referring to universal screening with a benchmark followed by progress monitoring. Um, and so the, the core element for tier one is that there's high quality classroom instruction. So sometimes uh, supporting teachers uh, in their role um, can uh, help to elevate the quality of the classroom instruction and learning opportunities for the students, not just on your caseload, but also uh, the, the classroom as a whole. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So when tier one is insufficient, or when children are showing that they're on progress monitoring initiatives, that they're not making progress, or at the pace that uh, would be ideal, uh, then you see the one asterisk here, that it's based on some predetermined criteria. And we'll talk about criteria in a minute. So this uh, um, is supplemental to classroom instruction. Now that's not to say that it can't be in the classroom, and ideally it would be. So the SLP uh, working in the classroom is, as we talked about before, uh, has the greatest uh, opportunity for carryover, being able to identify issues of functionality for that, that student in the classroom, as well as uh, the opportunities to benefit uh, the teacher, as well as other students uh, who are not on your caseload, but um, provide those opportunities. But it can be pulled out um, in small groups um, uh, when, it's, uh, when that uh, level of support is insufficient, then tier three, which is one-on-one -on -one intensive support. So what these three tiers are is they're increasing level of intensity and individualized support for the, the student. So what is the SLP's role in uh, RTI? So at tier one, the uh, many SLPs are doing consultation at the classroom level. They may also be doing professional development, and this has the opportunity to impact a large number of children via their teachers by providing professional development to the teachers and other school personnel. Uh, also assisting with the design of screening and progress monitoring methods and supporting high quality instruction, uh, incorporating language uh, that's relevant to the curriculum. Collaborate at tier two, they collaborate in planning and implementing uh, um, uh, programming, as well as uh, monitoring the progress of any of the supplemental instruction for students uh, who are struggling in, in oral and written language, uh, and particularly related to aspects of the curriculum. Uh, 
And at tier three, they're, they're, uh, they provide specialized assessment and treatment for students with DLD and other communication disorders that, uh, uh, that may uh, be necessary for one-on-one -on -one level of uh, intensity, but um, ideally uh, working within the classroom uh, at the first opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so there's some uh, materials here that you can read a little more about in terms of the, uh, how the SLP fits in, but this kind of captures it in a, a concise way. So responsiveness to intervention, or RTI, we see here that we've got uh, the tiers of support. So we've got at the bottom, the, the widest amount of support or the widest number of students is high quality instruction and in interactions with everyone in the classroom uh, and supporting that teacher. Um, uh, and then at the tier two level, education led groups uh, uh, following language programming. It could be following or it could be an initiative to uh, do more uh, in classroom uh, supports. And then at the highest level, the direct uh, SLP intervention uh, uh, and or indirect uh, intervention through an SLPA or an educational assistant, etc. So um, we see the three tiers in brown. Uh, we see the, uh, the level of uh, support in blue uh, to the right. Uh, to the left, we see the children uh, that, that all children can uh, benefit from uh, all levels of support with the SLP working together with the teacher. Um, and then uh, the SLP providing more uh, specialized support um, at the tier one and tier two levels and their uh, precise expertise at the tier three level. So the role of the SLP in schools is largely determined by the administration, the institution that you're working with, and, um, and the movement toward more collaborative work uh, in ecologically valid settings, such as in the classroom, is uh, a part of what's happening in the field right now. Although I have to say that the research evidence uh, isn't as forthcoming as it should be um, uh, to make this uh, push in um, efforts, but we can certainly see uh, based on opportunities in the classroom that it would be advantageous, but we do need the research to uh, support those uh, efforts. And then current funding models can result in a limited time for direct intervention. Uh, many SLPs are doing consultative work uh, because they just simply don't have the time. Largely their, their responsibilities are uh, assessment, diagnoses, uh, uh, IBP planning and goal setting and, uh, um, and consultation to the, uh, the school-based team. So here we see again that we've got the three tiers on the left. Uh, we can see that the method of assessment for our tier one is universal screening. And we've also, uh, we have uh, the different ways that it can be, uh, our, our intervention can be uh, uh, monitored or, or our tier one, the progress monitoring of performance. So that's a score that has been predetermined to identify children who are at risk. Can be growth over time, or it can be both the level of performance and then change over time. So this is really something that has to be decided among the team or the institutional administration, how to determine which children move to tier two uh, support. Tier two is, is a small group. It can be in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Uh, often it's standardized tests that are required for eligibility for the funding. Um, and the, uh, there's a baseline that is then uh, used as a means of determining the uh, uh, change over time or growth uh, over time. And dynamic assessment uh, can be uh, very effective in terms of seeing stimulability, uh, in terms of the child, uh, child's readiness to learn that particular skill. And then tier three, again, uh, dynamic assessment, uh, and there may be repetition of uh, standardized, test, uh, standardized assessment uh, at this level um, uh, over time to, to determine uh, continuing eligibility for services. All right, so we monitor the progress using a wide variety of tools. There are a number of screening tools that can be used. Uh, there's a number of uh, progress monitoring tools that can be used. And there's a couple of links here that you can look at, the first being for phonological awareness and literacy screening, and the second one being uh, for literacy screening. We do have to be mindful that we uh, are, even our assessment is evidence-based practice in terms of the kinds of tools that we use for our assessments. So you'll see this again in lecture seven when we talk about evidence-based practice. But this is a combined uh, um, uh, bringing together the client's perspective, the clinical expertise of the SLP, as well as the external scientific evidence or research that uh, supports it. So um, uh, we do need to keep that in mind, even for at the assessment level. All right, so an RTI case study, 
So Sally, the grade one teacher, is uh, a teacher in one of your schools and you have students in her classroom. Uh, she's recently received approval to conduct universal screening in both spoken and written language this year. Uh, this came about because last year a number of students experienced difficulty and she uh, really wants to get uh, ahead of it and identify children early this year. So she met with the SLP, you, um, and uh, who, um, and, and so in this case, uh, the Dr. Adloff's whole screen language screener. So this method, uh, this uh, tool is similar to the TROG. Um, uh, it's, it's related to grammar. You'll have to look up what the uh, acronym means. But Dr. Uh, Suzanne, um, who's a colleague of mine, created this whole class screener that can be administered in like 10 minutes for the, the entire class and have a pretty good, uh, we have pretty good in benchmarks in relation to predicting which children will go on to have uh, oral language difficulties uh, because it's largely focused on morphosyntax. And also uh, for the literacy related component, they would use the Dibbles 8 uh, measure of phonological awareness, letter knowledge, and non-word reading fluency. So these were administered in the first week of September by the teacher. Uh, seven children did not meet threshold for the language screener and six of these were below threshold for print knowledge and reading, which those benchmarks tend to be slightly behind because they're leaving room for at this grade one level for children being able to uh, benefit from instruction uh, when, the, the, when there's a shift to focusing largely on learning to read. The team uh, decisions were to monitor the children's print knowledge word reading uh, um, until uh, November 1st, when a second form of the Dibbles uh, measures, uh, I think Dibbles is now referred to as a cadence, but you can look that up if you're interested, uh, would be uh, administered to all of the students. Um, so all of these uh, seven students. And then during the second week, the SLPM teacher will team teach phonological awareness and spelling patterns to the whole class to start the year off well. So at that time, both the SLP and the teacher will observe the seven children's functional language in the classroom with specific criteria to look for, and then they'll debrief afterward. So based on the screener results and the observations of both professionals, four children were referred to the SLP for an assessment, and the other three children would be monitored by the teacher until October 1st, when the SLP will come in for a one teach one drift, uh, which is a service delivery model where uh, the SLP and teacher work together in the classroom uh, and it allows one teacher to be responsible for the instruction and the other to, uh, to, to walk around and provide uh, differentiated instruction as needed. So to observe all of the seven children and make recommendations uh, related to supportive instructional strategies as well as whether to continue to monitor progress uh, for language for those uh, remaining children or move to a formal assessment. Further, the SLP will provide an update on the assessment of the four children, read levels of severity, and possible models for intervention based on the assessment results and the current caseload of the SLP. So I realized that was a long uh, case study. You may want to read it by yourself. But I want you to think about, uh, do you think that this amount of focus on children who are considered at risk for four academic, poor academic outcomes is realistic in most school settings? Also, what justification can you give for why this is ideal? And then what, if anything, might you change about this process? So I'd like for you to go on the class forum, which is at the top of the eClass site, and I'd like for you to post your responses to these questions and start the conversation with your peers related to uh, uh, this case study. So children with DLD, as we've discussed, are likely to have difficulty with uh, understanding instructions, uh, uh, particularly if it includes unfamiliar vocabulary or complex syntax like embedded clauses. They'll struggle with multiple step instructions. Uh, again, there that's because there's often uh, syntactic complexity and there's a burden on memory load. This also um, requires visual supports for task analysis. Uh, that means to break down the task into steps so that the student it can it's manageable um, because there's only one step to focus on and then move to the next step. They experience trouble understanding decontextualized and figurative language. They have limited ability to use comprehension monitoring, so to, to check in with themselves and, and determine if they understand what uh, was just said. And then they have difficulty controlling their impulses and maintaining attentional control. And this is just to name a few. Excuse me. All right, so very quickly, how do kids, children get on your radar? So school screening, um, universal screening is ideal because then even the children who nobody's looking at uh, may come up as uh, problematic and that they're struggling. 
In school referrals, either parent expressing concerns or the teacher making a referral, you should know that it's the principal that makes the referral and, and approves the funding. And then between school referrals. And here's some links if you want to look at screening measures. I'll be back in a minute. 